And so Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi, when he began attacking that belief, at one point he came to the masjid and some of the uh, Ash'ari theologians there began to interrogate him on his creed. I mean, it got that serious. And he said, my creed predates your creed. And so they got in a huge discussion. And so some of the Ash'ari scholars said, no, you've deviated. And Sheikh Abdul, Abdul Ghani bin Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi says, because Imam Muwafiq al-Din at the time was there with him. And Imam Muwafiq al-Din became angry because this is his first cousin. So it's not only another Muslim, but Abdul Ghani bin Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi is his first cousin. So we all know how people can be about family. So Imam Muwafiq al-Din Imam Qudam rahimahullah, he says, the person that you claim lineage to for 40 years of his life was upon falsehood and still was not completely established after he left it. He is our son, he claimed our creed, and we judge him by our creed. Well, obviously there was an incident. And there led to, it led to just, you know, sometimes scuffles and fist fights. We already mentioned some of the other things that happened. So Abdul Ghani bin Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi had to leave. Right, he came to Egypt, and he taught hadith there up until the day that he died. Sheikh Abu Omar, Ibn Muhammad, uh, Sheikh Abu Omar Ibn Qudama, he began building a large madrasa near Qasiyun Mountain in 597 AH, the same year Ismail Ibn Tuhtikin died. Same year that he died. Okay? Now, we want to mention some of those who died in this time. You had Abu Barakat Al Khidr Ibn Shibal Al Dimashqi, the great Shafi'i scholar, Abdul Jalil Ibn Abi As'ad Al Harawi. The great Hadith scholar of Herat. Abdul Karim ibn Muhammad ibn Mansur al Marwazi, the Shafi'i scholar, all of these died in 562 AH. You then had Abu Najid, Abu, Abu, Abu Najib al Suhrawardi, Zainuddin Ali ibn Kujak, who was the head over Irbil. And he also rebelled against the Khalifa Muqtafi, but after that, after their dispute, he came under his authority and accepted him. There was also Muhammad ibn Abdul Hamid al Samarqandi, the Hanafi jurist, Fatima bint Muhammad al Baghdadiya, Abu Ali Hibatullah al Baghdadi. All of these died in 563 AH. We then had Abdul Khaliq ibn Asr al Dimashqi, the great Hanafi scholar in the East. Because the Hanafis in the East were the main ones that were the strongest in the Madhab. The Arab Hanafis were trying to catch up with them. Now it's slightly top heavy where the Arab Hanafis have had a little bit more development in fiqh. And it's the Central Asian Hanafis that are still in need of more development. The Damascene Hanafis and the Egyptian Hanafis have jumped ahead. If you look at Ibn Abidin, Qutlubagha, Badruddin al-Aini, all these Egyptian and Shami Han, the Arab Hanafis have sort of jumped ahead. Well, at this point, back in time, when we go here, it was the Central Asian Hanafis that had jumped ahead. Why? Because their creed was intact. Their creed was intact, and they were the ones that defended the creed because Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. You have Ali ibn Muhammad al-Balansi, the great scholar and judge of Andalus. Balansi today is called Falinthia. Today is called Falinthia. Okay, they call it that. But Balansi is where he's from. To think that a place that produced ulama like that is now a tourist destination where you see men with t-shirts and short shorts and gray socks pulled up to their knees in brown sandals trooping around this location. There were big ulama that came from this place. Big ulama that came from this area. Further to this, you also had Abu al-Barakat ibn al-Husri who was a good friend to Imam ibn al-Jawzi. He was a classmate with him. All of these died in 564 AH. There was Abu al-Karam ibn al-Darir, who was a Hanbali jurist. Ibn Halim al-Baghdadi, who was a Hanafi scholar and also specialized in the disciplines of the soul. These died in 566 AH. Then there was Khadija bint Ahmed al Nahrawani in 570 AH. Just a quick question for you to peruse. Where are the female scholars today that are like these that are being put on the map, that are being mentioned, that people can take from? I went to take from a female scholar once and was told it was haram. Where are they? I'll leave that for you to answer. Then there was Ibn Asakir, the great Shafi'i Alam. Ibn Asakir wrote numerous books, 
particularly one defending Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari and his theology, because some of the scholars in his time uh, began to denigrate, not all of them, but some of them began to denigrate, denigrate Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, some of the Maturidi, some of the Hanbalis, because they said, our imams started out correct with the correct creed. Your imam started out with a deviated creed and tended to keep, still hold on to the deviation when he came to the Orthodox faith. So there was still that dispute. So he decided to write books to defend that. He died in 571 AH. We have Abu al-Fat al-Hanafi al-Harawi in 572 AH, one of the great, great Hanafi scholars. You will see later as we go along, the Hanafis built a dynasty in Afghanistan in terms of their knowledge, particularly the Patans. You had Mullah Ali Qari, the great scholar, great Hanafi scholar, Mujaddid al afthani His title is actually the Mujaddid of the 12th century. Ahmed Sarhindi, Imam Ahmed Rida Khan. These were the people that were the proper scholars. And so they continued in Afghanistan and the places around there. We also find in this time, Shuhada bint Abi Nasr, 574AH. Imam Ibn as in 575 AH. Shamsud Dawla al Malik al Mu'addam. Turan Shah, the older brother of Salah ad -Din, whose sister had him buried at her school in Sham in 576 AH. You have Abu Hassan al Bajarai in 588, who was a student and a teacher at the Madrasa of Imam Abdul Qadir al Jilani. You have Shu'ib ibn al Hussein at Tilmisani, who was also called Abu Madian. Now he's very important. People uh, who know about him. He's sometimes called Sheikh al-Shuyukhina, the Sheikh of our Sheikhs. Abu Madian is coming from that North African region. Those that claim lineage to the Shadiliya will often mention Abu Madian. <laughs> he was known for his rigorous fasting, his worship, his knowledge of the states of the human self, and was a self and was a self-realized saint. He is to Morocco, perhaps what Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was to Baghdad in terms of his importance. Abu Madian, his knowledge of the states of the heart and his careful detail that he took when discussing matters of the religion showed his righteousness, a Maliki. Maliki. But Abu Madian was a great scholar. And that can't be disputed that can't be disputed. He traveled throughout North Africa, sitting with different ulama and different sheikhs. He is such a revered figure. If you go to the library in this city, there's a study that's been made about him that's 300 pages long. I advise you if you can, not all of you, because it's only one book. But if if Take turns, if you can, order it, Amazon it, if you can, to get the book about Abu Median. It's just titled with his name. I, I'm not able to remember off the top of my head the particular Kafir that translated it. But this Kafir took the trouble to learn Arabic, and he has kept the Arabic text in the book next to the English on the opposite page, and discussed and uh, salivated over Abu Median and his rank and how noble he was. And I thought to myself when reading this, I hope this man entered Islam. Knowing what he knows, if he died of a sudden coronary or arterial sclerosis, he's finished. Because you don't know about someone like this and then up and die Kafir. You just cannot do this. So this book, it's a major achievement. Abu Median is a major scholar. Major scholar. Further to this is Muhammad ibn Rustum, who was the judge. He was one of the judges of the 40 Abdal. He did not marry, but had numerous wonders attributed to him. He had numerous wonders attributed to him. He died in 598 H. You have Abu al Fatih Uthman, who was the son of Salah ad Din. He was head over Egypt. Abu al Walid Muhammad ibn Rushd, the grandson of Ibn Rushd. Someone who was a great scholar was that one. Ibn Rushd's grandson. You then had at the same time someone claiming to be the returned Christ. And so the Muslims crucified him <laughs> for his blasphemy. And some people were led astray by him. And this happened in the year 595 
a H. So the people that would say, well, I'm the return, I'm the return Christ, and they crucified him, that would be impossible. Because obviously, he'd be the Messiah, and the Muslims knew that this was false. So someone claiming prophethood, or claiming prophecy, or claiming reincarnation, we wouldn't accept someone saying, I am Napoleon, or I am the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam again, or I am the Prophet Isa again. The Muslims did not accept that, and so he was crucified. Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimullah, died in the year 597 A.H., 597 A.H. He wrote 500 books. Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimullah, wrote 500 books. It is he that I want to use as the baseline of our tafsir class, inshallah, if Allah causes us to live that long. It is his tafsir I want to use. He had his own observatory in his home. He was a doctor. He was a botanist. He was a chemist. He was a historian. His text, Al-Muntadham, which is one of the foundational ones for our history class that we're going through now, is more than 20 volumes. He is one of the most important figures of Baghdad. Studies have been written on him. There are people in Lebanon that have written doct uh, doctoral theses on him because simply of his rank where there are volumes and volumes and volumes long. Ibn al Jozi is not a small player on the stage of fiqh, creed, or any of the other sciences of Islam, or even the material sciences that these people talk about. He's the same one that said that the, that the earth, in reference to the sun, it would take 45,000 earths to make the size of the sun. He's the same one that said the earth is 93 million miles from the sun. He's the same one that told us that the earth weighs six sextillion tons. He's the same one. He's the same one that told us how fast the earth is going. He's the same one that told us that it's going around the sun. A lot of this cosmological information, the place where we're sitting now, we think it's advanced. But people back then were advanced. So that makes, that makes you understand then what else have they not told you? What else have they kept hidden from you about these different scholars and these different people? What else have they lied to you about? One of the most dangerous things is when you take on someone's language without self-reflection. If you only speak one language and you can only read and communicate in one language, I genuinely feel repentant towards you. I feel, I feel rueful towards you because you are one of the deceived. As long as you stay like that, you will never, ever be able to test anything and you'll be forced to believe them. Do we honestly believe George Washington cut down a cherry bush and when he was asked about the cherry tree, I cannot tell a lie, I cut down that cherry tree? Cherry trees don't even grow in Virginia where he's from. But people believe that because that's the only language they've had as a language of currency. I ask you to look at your children and to look at your families and to think, what language will we use? Because language shapes your perception. It shapes how you view the world. It shapes how you do things. Look at some languages. The first word that comes will be the noun and then the adjective. So in Arabic, if you have a man who's tall, rajulun tawil, he's a man who is tall. The noun comes first. Why? Because the noun's what's important, not the describer. But in English, black man, white man. Does it make you ever wonder why they have such a preoccupation with race? I mean it. And we, by using their language, if it's your only language that you speak, you don't have any other parameters to go outside of to study and understand that you've been hoodwinked. And so you take on the same thing. You're in the elevator, someone who is melanin enriched gets on, and you clutch your purse. <laughs> you know what I mean. You sit in your car. I've seen people who are scared when a Muslim walks by and they put their hands in their pockets. And when they see someone who is melanin deprived, they take their heart. Oh, I'm glad I saw them. They're actually terrified to see Muslims or people who are melanin enriched because they've been given that. They've been given that. And that came from somewhere. And that's why it's so important, this history. If you look at Salah al-Din Layubi, he spoke Arabic, he spoke Farsi, and he spoke Kurdish. Our people were tri multilingual. Our people were polyglots. 
This 